Amen. God's word does endure forever. I've got to tell you, um, Chuck Libertor and I were laughing. Um, we uh, we like to razz one another, and before uh, the service started, I said, you know, now Chuck, don't embarrass us this morning when you're up front. And he leaned over during meet and greet and says, "Serves you right." <laughs> Apparently, I should be the one worried about embarrassing us. Let's, uh, let's pray before we approach God's Word so I don't say anything else stupid. <laughs> Father, we, uh, we love you, and we come before you right now asking for your help, Lord. We know that the things of God are spiritually discerned, so if we're going to see truth here this morning, we are going to need your help. Lord, would you open our eyes to behold the glory of Jesus? Would you show us how true His words are, and give us the discernment and the courage to walk them out. Lord, guard us from error this morning and guide us in the truth of Your Word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, like it or lump it, Tiger Woods has distinguished himself as one of the biggest names in golf. And although he is no longer, of course, at the top of his game, virtually everyone would agree that Tiger Woods' contribution to the sport of golf is nothing short of spectacular. And yet, there's no shortage of headlines over the years about how other aspects of Tiger Woods' personal life have been, shall we say, less commendable than his golf game. Suffice it to say... If Tiger were, uh, Woods excuse me, were leading a marriage conference here in town, you'd probably think twice about attending that one, right? In a very similar vein, if you needed brain surgery, you would do your best to go to the absolute most qualified, best surgeon available to you, even if you heartily disagreed with his or her politics or moral compass. What's my point? Talking about Tiger Woods, talking about brain surgeons. Well, we all understand, all of us, that there can be things that we appreciate about people in some areas of their lives without necessarily endorsing everything that they do. We're going to need to remember that this morning as we approach Jesus' words and we encounter in Luke chapter 16 one of his more hard-to-swallow parables, namely the parable of the dishonest manager. So let me invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Luke 16. We're cresting a new chapter today, the Gospel of Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 1. As has often been observed about this parable of the dishonest manager, what we have here in Jesus' teaching is a good lesson from a bad example. A good lesson from a bad example. And I don't know about you, but I, for one, have learned some really good lessons, some hard but good lessons in my life from bad examples. From bad circumstances. I remember one time as a a young man, I was on the phone with my father, just kind of seeking wisdom, and I was really struggling with my relationship with a boss. And I was venting. That's probably what I was just doing, right? Complaining about all of the ways uh, in, in which I did not appreciate his leadership. And my father said something very wise to me. He said, you know, Zeb, one time I worked for a hard boss. And I think I learned more in that difficult situation than in any other situation uh, work-wise. I learned a lot about what not to do and the kind of leader about uh, how, how not to be. And I thought, wow, there's wisdom there. We can learn, can't we? Even from secular examples, even from pagan examples, even from uh, non-righteous examples, wisdom for how to live life and how to follow Christ. And here is the Lord Jesus himself giving us an example, giving us things to do, kingdom ways to live, elucidated through the life of this unrighteous, dishonest manager. Let's let's read now. Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 1. He, speaking of Jesus, also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that 
This man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do, since my master is taking away the management from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. He said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then he said to another, How much do you owe? He said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you've not been faithful in what is another's, who will give to you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. All right. Well, Jesus is prompting us to learn some good lessons, as we've said, from this bad example. And he tells us this parable here in Luke 16 about a rich man, a a very rich man, I will note, and his dishonest manager. I'd like you to look at verse 1 more closely and find the word wasting. The charge against the dishonest manager here is that he was wasting, that's how the ESV renders it in verse 1, his master's possessions. That word wasting in the original language of the New Testament in Koine Greek is the same exact word, this is sort of curious to note, the same exact word that Jesus has just used back in chapter 15 when he told the parable of the prodigal son. Same word, the prodigal son squandered his father's wealth. And this unrighteous manager here, this dishonest steward is wasting, same word in the Greek, squandering his master's money. So what we see after the parable of the prodigal son here in Luke 16 is Jesus telling a story about the parable of a prodigal manager, a bad prodigal steward. The master hears the account of his mismanagement, and he calls him to himself and makes it very clear to this guy that he will no longer retain his position. His stewardship is coming to a close. You're fired. That's what we say, right? Uh, But before he left his position, so he had to settle his accounts and and his books, and and so Jesus tells the parable. Before we get to this uh, unrighteous steward's action plan for how to move forward in his future, what we see here in verse 3 is his internal crisis. You see him talking to himself? Some of us do this, right? When we're going through difficult times, he has this, what am I going to do moment? And he begins to think about his options. I'm too weak to to dig all day long. That won't do, this white-collar worker says, even back into that day. And I'm too ashamed to beg. What am I going to do? And then we see his solution, this eureka moment in verse 4. I know what I'll do. And I want you to look closely at the text here, Luke 16, 4. What is this steward, this manager on his way out, what's his motivation for moving forward? He says, I know what I'll do so that, 
that is purpose, that is the reason, so that people may receive me into their houses. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? What did this guy need to do? Well, at the time, stewards would have been living on their master's property as they managed their resources. This guy's not only out of a job, he's out of a house. He needs provision. He needs to find a place to stay. And so he's concerned about people receiving him into their houses. Now, take note of that language because we're going to see very, very similar language again in verse 9. Receive me into their houses or their dwelling places. Uh, So what's he do? The, the plan is unraveled here in verses 5 to 7. This steward acts quickly. By the way, a crook is always acting quickly, aren't they? Sign here now. He acts quickly, and he calls his master's debtors to himself, and he starts to, to slash their bills, doesn't he? And, and no, these are major major deductions in the amount of money or resources that, that's owed to the, the manager's master. Now let's pause here for a second because there is an alternative interpretation to this parable which has been uh, gaining a little bit of traction more recently. It's still the minority view, but there are some people, uh, some Bible teachers as they're reading through this parable who, uh, who will try to make the whole thing just a little bit more palatable by saying that this manager is really acting magnanimously. He's not really engaged in fraud. He's not wasting his master's money or resources. What he's doing is reducing the cost of his own kickback from the deals that he's arranged. If we can use this language, the the language of his own commission. So some, some folks will presume to say that managers at this time didn't get paid a regular wage like we would uh, receive today from an employer, but the way that he would receive his wages in that time, in addition to living in his master's home, is that as he was negotiating deals, he would upcharge uh, the, the folks that he was involved in business dealings uh, with the authority of his master's resources, and anything that he charged over and above what they owed the master, well, that was his wages. That was his commission, if, if you will. And uh, folks interpreting the parable this way will say, well, well, that's why this uh, unrighteous manager was in so much trouble. He was charging these exorbitant fees uh, to pocket money for himself. And what he's doing here, as he's calling all of his master's debtors to himself, is he's just merely cutting out his own commission so that these folks will owe him a favor. Well, that relieves all the tension from this parable, doesn't it? That, w- that might ostensibly explain why the manager, instead of saying, you crook, you wasted my money, you swindled me out of all of the, that which was owed to me, actually commends him. It sort of uh, makes us feel a little bit better about this guy. Um, I will put my cards on the table. You guys can be Bereans and go uh, ch- chase down that interpretation and see if it holds biblical weight. My personal uh, opinion is that I am not convinced uh, by that argument, and the reason why I'm not is right here in the text. Look at verse 8 with me. Right after explaining what the unrighteous steward does, we see in verse 8, Jesus call him a dishonest manager. He's, he's a dishonest manager. In other words, his, his actions here are not actions of integrity. They're, they're crooked. They're unjust. So, so I think actually what's happening here is the plain reading of the parable, the traditional interpretation. This guy, as he is, uh, as he is being relieved of his duties, calls his master's debtors together, and he just starts slashing debts, and his master is the one taking the hit for it. By the way, 
I think we should just pause here and, uh, and make a note about how to, how to interpret the Bible. Uh, sometimes we, we stumble across passages in Scripture that we really don't know what to do with. They cause problems in our hearts and in our heads. we got questions, and we can be tempted sometimes, I think, to latch on to interpretations from Scripture that relieve the problem, that, that, that relieve the tension for us. You know, there's a way of, uh, of sometimes reaching even outside the Bible to find the evidence that we want or we need. Maybe it's archaeological evidence. Maybe we're making a cultural claim about the way things worked back then. But because, uh, because of something that's outside the Bible, then we import it in and say, okay, now I can read the text in a way that makes me feel better and helps me under, understand this thing easier. I just want to say uh, to you this morning, Friendship Community Church, I would really caution us from that way of reading the Bible. There's nothing wrong as you're reading Scripture of understanding the cultural context uh, into which the Scriptures are written uh, and, uh, and, and of using archaeology and a number of other different tools, linguistic tools, to better understand your Bible. But here's the rub. When you're finding something that Scripture doesn't say, if you're, if you're latching, if you're building your whole argument on something outside of Scripture in order to say something that the clear teaching of scripture says to relieve your problem, then uh, I, I think you're probably standing on uh, rather shaky ground. So, so here is, we're reading Luke chapter 16. Uh, you're welcome to, to go, uh, as I said, uh, test my teaching and, uh, and, and see what kind of interpretation you can find. But as, as I'm reading here in Luke 16, I'm seeing Jesus call this guy a dishonest steward. And I'm saying, okay, the things that he was doing then were not magnanimous. He wasn't cutting his own uh, uh, gains in order to earn these favors. No, no. He, what he was really doing is swindling his master out of this money. And so now that I've just sort of rebuilt this tension for you, I think we should uh, begin to keep working our way through the parable. Let's, let's ask this question, because I think this is worthy of asking. How much money, then, are we talking about? Well, to mispronounce the French, as we love to do in English, we're talking about bukus of money. This is a lot of money. Look at verse 6. Now, these two examples that we get of the debts that are slashed are representative, probably, of, of, of many more. He calls all of his master's debtors to himself. We get two examples here. The first one in verse 6 is uh, a guy who owes the steward's master 100 measures of oil. Now, this is olive oil and 100 measures. I don't know if you're up on your like, biblical weights and measures, uh, but, but this would have been a massive amount of olive oil. We're talking roughly 875 gallons of olive oil. Now, I'm not really in the olive oil business, but can you imagine how many olives it takes cr to crush in order to get just one gallon of olive oil? We're talking a massive operation, are we not? Uh, experts have sort of done the math, and as, as, as best they can guess, it's estimated that it would have taken about 150 olive trees, an entire ol ol olive grove, the entire year yield of 150 olive trees just to get this kind of production. We're talking an astronomical figure that's owed to the master here. And what's the unrighteous steward does do? He slashes it right in half, doesn't he? 875 gallons, 100 measures, make it 50, he says. Whoo! That's a lot of money that's just gone away because he's signing on the dotted line here. Similarly, we see a wheat debt next, and, and that figure, financially speaking, is even more substantial. 100 measures of wheat translates to about 1,000 bushels. We're talking very labor-intensive crops here of, of threshing the weed and all that was required to get these bushels. 
Roughly speaking, this was probably equivalent to about eight years worth of wages. And here he says, take off 20%. 100 100 measures a week, make it 80. A massive amount of money, which really, again, builds the problem for us. So we ought to stop here and ask, how is it then that Jesus is commending this? How is it that the master here, who would seem to indicate or reflect God in this parable, the master seems to be commending this guy for dealing in such underhanded ways? What gives? What's going on here? So we think about applying this passage to our lives today. Should should we here at Friendship Community uh, Church start an embezzlement ministry? Start rolling out some pyramid schemes? Is that that what we should do to obey Jesus here in Luke 16? Of course not. Because it's not the dishonesty of the steward that's being commended. It's what? The master commended the steward for his shrewdness. It's his shrewdness. It's his cunning. It's his Clever ingenuity that's being praised here, not his dishonest dealings. What was this guy after? What was this manager trying to do as he's in the process of losing his job, of losing his home? Well, well, he was trying to secure his future, was he not? And an honor culture in the first century context in this part of the world... These folks, having uh, been extended such a great favor, would now owe this guy something and feel obligated to take care of him. What's he doing? He's he's securing his future. Verse 4 again, his goal was to ensure after he's fired that these people would, quote, receive him into their houses. And Jesus makes the point from there. He says, this is what the sons of this world, can also be translated the sons of this age, this is what the people of this world are very good at doing, Jesus says. The sons of this age are very good at using their wealth, at using their temporal resources to secure their temporal future. And we see, I think, Jesus' first lesson here in verse 9. The first takeaway. What what in the world are we supposed to make of this? Well, I think Jesus really spells it out for us here with three simple applications. The first one in verse 9. Let's read it again. Jesus says, I tell you, here's what you ought to do, guys. Make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they, the friends you've made, may receive you into the eternal dwellings. What in the world is Jesus saying to us here? To make friends by means of unrighteous wealth? Well, the word for wealth here can be translated a couple of different ways. Wealth can mean money, just broadly construed. Wealth can mean wealth. (laughs) Wealth can also mean any material possessions. Wealth here, in this context, is is strictly speaking, the, the things of this world, the physical resources at our disposal. The Greek word here for wealth is actually the word mamanas. Mama, it's kind of fun to say. Mamanas. It's where some of the older translations in the Eng- your English Bibles will sometimes translate or transliterate this word as mammon. Is anybody working from the King James or the New King James? It probably just says the word, instead of wealth, it says the word mammon here. Now that word, mamanas, that's the Greek word, sometimes translated mammon or money or wealth. It's, it's the physical resources at our disposal in this life. Only occurs four times in Scripture, and we see three of those four occurrences right here in this passage. In Luke chapter 16, in verse 9, in verse 11, in verse 13. Make friends, Jesus says, by means of mammon, by means of unrighteous, not sinful, but worldly wealth. Verse 11, if you've not been faithful with your mammon, 
If you've not been faithful with the, the physical resources at your ex- disposal here in this life, then how are you going to be faithful with real, big resources, Jesus is saying? And then he ends the whole parable in verse 13 with this interesting exhortation. You cannot serve God and mamanas, God and mammon. You can't serve God and money. So what's Jesus' charge to us here? Well, not go be a swindler, not go be dishonest. Jesus' charge to us is use the mammon of this world. Use your money, your material possessions, your physical resources here in life and put them to work. Only instead of providing for your temporal resources like this unrighteous manager, Jesus tells us, Jesus tells his disciples, isn't that who he tells the parable to in verse 1? Jesus tells his disciples, those who would come after him and learn from him and follow him, to use their money and resources to, quote, purchase friends, where? For eternity. Now that's interesting. The point then that Jesus is driving at in this parable is for you and for me, for those who would follow Jesus, to invest our mammon, to invest our physical resources into kingdom enterprises, to see the work of the gospel multiplied. The point is, not our temporal gain that this steward was all wrapped up in securing, but it's to build friendships that last for eternity. Isn't that Jesus' point? It's very clear, actually, as you begin to splice it and break it down here. Those who are the beneficiaries of these eternal investments will then in turn welcome, what a beautiful picture, welcome you in to their eternal dwelling places. There's almost the sense in which Jesus says, when you walk into eternity, you will be greeted there by those who have been the recipients of your investments. That's a fascinating thought, isn't it? Jesus' instruction is not, go beat the world at their own game. Go out and manage, folks, for your own personal benefit and the accumulation of your resources on this side of the sun. No, Jesus says, use what you got and be shrewd about it. Be cunning about it. Be creative about it to invest in eternal dwellings. Almost reminds you of what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, does it not? Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. You know you can do that? And in a fascinating way, Jesus says, use your physical resources to do that. Huh. Now, We should note that Jesus says in verse 9, there will be a time when this mammon, this money, this wealth, these physical resources at your disposal fails. Not if, he says, but when it fails. That's fascinating. When it fails. We all know this. You can't take it with you. No matter how many resources you accumulate to yourself in this, in this world, it's not going with you. And so Jesus says, that's my entire point. Use these resources then to invest in things you can take with you. Isn't that fascinating? That you actually can send something up, as it were, to heaven. Those some things are souls. There's going to be souls. How do you do that, Jesus? Well, there's going to be souls, he says, worshiping in all of eternity because you have poured out your treasure and your temporal resources into kingdom growth, into gospel initiatives. So, we got to ask ourselves, how, 
How do we do that? What's, what's that look like for us here at Friendship Community Church in 2024? Well, well, here's one very clear application point, I would think, and it's simply this. Friends, as followers of Jesus, we are called to invest in the eternal with what we have right now. What might that look like for you or for me? Well, perhaps it looks like supporting in the work of missionary efforts throughout the world. Benjamin and the missions team are going to be uh, having a lunch after church today where they consider just, just uh, how we here at FCC can advance the ball down the court, how we can learn in reaching people to the ends of the earth for the, for, for the gospel of Christ. Clearly one way that you can invest your physical resources, your mammon, in dwellings that last for eternity is to use your resources for missionary work. What a beautiful thing for, for Bible translation work. Uh, is, isn't that what Benjamin was talking about before? He, as he was praying earlier that, that the Lord would raise up workers to, to focus on Bible translation so that people who don't have God's Word in their own language can read and grow as they follow Jesus Christ. Investing in missionaries, investing in Bible translation work, that much is clear. How about this one, though? A little bit closer to home, perhaps. How about investing resources in a neighbor or befriending someone on your street and just having them over for dinner. Does that cost you something? Sure it does. But beginning to be intentional about investing your food, your time, opening up your home, on building relationships that could potentially give you the opportunity to share the gospel. And if God should choose to turn on the light and to take a, a dead, stony heart of, uh, that, that was opposed to Jesus, was, was an enemy of God, and, and, and draw that enemy unto himself, if they should trust in Jesus, what have you done? Well, you've made for yourself, through some very simple, temporal resources, a friendship that will last into all eternity. Investing in neighbors and friends. Some of you, I, I know, are, 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 are very intentional about this. What's it look like for us here at FCC to be intentional about investing in to family relationships? To the relationship with that niece or nephew or perhaps that grandchild. What might it look like one day for that sweet reception in eternity with that person that you've just been pouring your life and your money and your time and your resources into. I think that's a clear application of how to do this. And, and I know many of you are very intentional about that. FCC, let's keep doing this. Let's not just use our resources to sort of get ahead, but rather to, to look around and see, man, how can we spur the body of Christ on, even my own family members on, by investing in them for kingdom purposes? Here's a crazy idea. What might it look like for some of us here to invest in a Christian high school where we're going to see young hearts and minds and lives very practically discipled and trained up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord in a very dark world out there. And those resources could potentially make eternal impacts. Certainly we should not be embarrassed to say that one way to obey this command from the Lord is to give joyfully to your local church, whether this one or another one, to see lives impacted as gospel ministry moves forward. We're just scratching the surface, right? These are just some simple examples here of how to use our earthly resources for heavenly impact. Now, we could... We could Give many examples here in this room or here in this building right now of people who are doing this. Well, let me just give you one, and she would be mortified that I was even just mentioning her name today, but just, just one simple, clear example from our community of faith, Linda Woods. Every single Sunday, without fail, 
Linda Woods gets here early. She invests her own resources in, in decorating that little uh, preschool classroom in ways that none of us even would imagine. She is investing into the lives and the relationships of these tiny little kids, mine included. I'm so grateful. There are kids who are now grown who are singing Scripture songs, gospel songs that Linda Woods taught them. I can't imagine what her eternal reward and reception is going to be because of her significant investment of her resources and her time and her talents into the kingdom of God through little preschoolers. That's just one example, right? I mean, we, I, I, could, I could give many more here, but just one practical example of what faithfulness in this area looks like. This is Jesus' exhortation to us. Use what you've got for kingdom impact. Now, I'm going to call some of you right now. There are some of us here, undoubtedly in this room, who are beginning to daydream you're dealing right now in the hypothetical. Some of you are beginning to think, well, wouldn't that be nice if I had the resources to give for that kind of impact for the kingdom? FCC, with as much pastoral grace as I can muster, I hope I can burst that little hypothetical bubble of yours if that's the way you're beginning to think. Because the truth is that if you're not living, if you're not investing in the kingdom that way right now, then you wouldn't do a thing differently if you fell waist deep in a pile of money. Oh, sure. If you just were just like stepped into all kinds of cash, if you won the lottery, perhaps the scale of the resources that you're working with may be different, but you wouldn't be one ounce more generous. Some of you are saying, you don't know me. That's not true. Well, before you form your objection, just keep on reading Jesus' words here. Because Jesus seems to think, verse 10, that if you've been faithful with a little, you'll be faithful with much. What's the inverse, the opposite implication? If you haven't been faithful with a little bit, you're not going to be faithful with much. It's almost like Jesus is anticipating our objection. The reason why I'm not doing this, Lord, is because, man, I'm just trying to make ends meet. You remember that story Jesus tells in Mark 12 about the widow's might? What fascinates me about that story is Jesus said, she, just dropping a little copper coin in to see the work of the kingdom expand, she gave more. That's what Jesus says. She's given more than all these teachers of the law and religious experts who are just dumping all kinds of resources in and making a show of it, by the way. Jesus' assessment is her might is a bigger investment to kingdom purposes. Does God need your money? No. <laughs> He doesn't need a blessed thing. He owes the cattle on a thousand hills, and His will is going to be accomplished. But God calls His disciples. Jesus is talking squared His followers right here, and He says, you need to be more shrewd. It's sad, isn't it? Jesus said that it's, it's like the, the children of this age seem to have this more dialed in than the children of light. Man, are they good at investing their resources to see even just their temporal kingdoms, their little fiefdom that they're building here on this side of the sun, to see those things be established. How should it be that that would be, that their efforts to do that should eclipse those of the children of light? You see, it's not about, Jesus is calling it here, it's not about how much you have. 
It's not about the bottom line or how much you're investing. It's about your heart, isn't it? It's about what your priorities are. Is your treasure here on earth or is it in heaven? That's the question Jesus is inviting us to ask. Now, now, clarification as we begin to talk through these issues. Undoubtedly, as we talk about investing our mammon, investing our, our physical resources, our material wealth to see the kingdom of God expand, there's somebody here who's thinking, danger, waving the, the yellow flag. Prosperity gospel, that's what Zeb's talking about this morning. Nothing could be further from the truth. No one is guaranteeing, least of which Jesus, that if you give more of your mammon, of your physical resources, of your money, of your wealth, to see the kingdom move forward, Jesus is not guaranteeing that the benefit you see is going to be here and now, is He? When does the benefit take effect? Eternal dwellings, right? That's when you see it. You're making a heavenly, eternal investment, Jesus is saying. Nothing about sowing a seed here so that you can see your, your health improve and your marriage improve and your 401k go through the roof. That's not what we're talking about. We're simply talking about what Jesus says elsewhere, your treasure being where your heart is. Are we, as the children of light, serious and intentional about seeing the resources, whether we've been given much or little, are we serious about seeing them sown into kingdom purposes? I think that's a second clear application as we begin to wrap this thing up. Take some time this morning, members of Friendship Community Church, and take stock of of how you are managing your material resources in the here and now. Because this, Jesus seems to think, is a great test of your character. Faithful in the small stuff? You'll be faithful in the big stuff, Jesus says. By the way, what's the small stuff? The small stuff here is your mammon. He says in verse 11, if then you've not been faithful in unrighteous wealth, mamanas. If you, according to Jesus, we, we seem to think that our money is the big stuff. Jesus is like, that's a little thing. That's the little stuff. If, if, if you can be faithful with the little stuff, God's going to entrust you with, with the big stuff, which is what? More money. No. The big stuff is eternal dwellings in ways that we can't understand rewards in heaven that the Lord is storing up for us there. Don't be deceived. A change in your circumstances, a change in your finances is not going to produce a change in your heart posture before the Lord. If you've been faithful with a little, Jesus says, you'll be faithful with much. So can we just commit, whether we're sitting on a little or we're sitting on a lot, Lord, I want to be faithful to you with my whole self. My mammon included. You know, it's funny. I, uh, I feel like I got a little uh, example of this, a little glimpse of this this week. Um, I like to do uh, breakfast with the kids in the Thomas household in the, in the morning. And, and um, my, some of my kiddos are going through a cereal kick. Only the bland cereal that the Thomases buy can be greatly enhanced by a little bit of honey. And so our boy Finn is in this kick where he's asking me every morning, Dad, can I put my honey on my cereal? What's he asking? When you're not looking, can I load this thing up, right? And so sometimes the answer is no, but sometimes the answer is yes. Why? Because I want to see, can he be faithful with a little? Because if he's trying to sneak that honey out of that, you know, that little honey bear thing from Aldi, Can I trust him with more? 
What if I, what if I said, yeah, go ahead, pour that gallon of milk, Finn. Now, there's, some, there's a weight issue there with a the little boy. What if I said, maple syrup season is around the corner for this New York boy. What if I said... When he asked me to pour the gallon worth of amber gold of maple syrup, you know how much the pure stuff is worth? My parents are, are making that. They're getting ready to make that here in March. Oh, it's like treasure. If I can't trust him with the honey bear, you think I'm going to trust him with the, <laughs> the, the gallon worth of pure New York grade A amber maple syrup? Uh-uh. Jesus says, if you're going to be faithful with a little, you'll be entrusted with much. Final application as we close this thing out. Your relationship to your mammon, your relationship to your money, to your material resources, is, I believe Jesus is showing us here in Luke 16, a very practical litmus test for idolatry. Ooh. You see, the things of this world, not just money, but including that, the things of this world can so easily become a snare to our hearts, can they not? And if you're chasing, if the, at the end of the day, your posture throughout life is to chase the things that your physical resources can secure, a comfortable life, a nice house, a, fill, fill in the blank. If that's the priority, then your affections are going to be wrapped up there, to use the language of Jesus in verse 13. You're going to be devoted to one master and despise the other. I read a quote by Philip Ryken this week. He says, every time we reach into our pocketbooks... He must have wrote this in like the 80s, right? Every time we reach into our wallets or every time we make an exchange electronically on our phones, every time we reach into our wallets, we're pulling something out of our hearts. To quote Sir Francis Bacon many hundreds of years ago, money is a great servant, but a very bad master. Isn't that true? It's a great tool. Jesus is telling us here in Luke 16, use it like a tool to invest in eternity. But don't let that tool become your taskmaster. And we should note here, I hope we always do this as we're reading the Gospels, we should stop here at the end and just consider Jesus. Consider the example of our Lord of our capital M master, you know, the master who set aside his wealth and the glories of heaven to come down and, and put on flesh, the, the master who gave up his own life to welcome us into his eternal dwelling place, that master. Remember those eternal dwellings in verse 9 that Jesus was talking about? i got to believe he was thinking about those eternal dwellings when he said elsewhere in the Gospel of John, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Listen now. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. And take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. You see, Jesus doesn't ask anything of his disciples that he has not modeled perfectly himself. The Jesus who was able to invest his divine life, to lay aside his glories and his wealth in order to secure for himself a dwelling place eternal and invite us to be part of it with him. And Jesus is saying, if you're my disciple, if you're my follower, your new nature as a follower of me is just to do the same. Is to invest what you have for the eternal view. That's the gospel. And I think we should end now by singing it. We, uh, 
We learned a song, or we reinforced a song a week or so ago called the Gospel Song. I think it's appropriate that we would just sing the Gospel as a close to our service today. It goes like this, Holy God in love became perfect man to bear my blame. On the cross He took my sin, by His death I live again. Let's pray and we'll sing. Father, we thank You for the Gospel. We thank You that Jesus did not account equality with God something to be grasped, but but made Himself into the likeness of a servant and taking on flesh. He humbled Himself even to death. Even to death on a cross to welcome us into His eternal dwelling. Lord, make us... Plant within us that seed of desire to steward our whole lives and to grow into the image and likeness of our Master Jesus. Lord, help the things of this world not to have a stranglehold on our lives. Lord, save us, we pray, from the idol of mammon, the idol of chasing the almighty dollar. And and even if it's not the the money, it's the things of life that, that can be seized by it or experienced here in this life. Father, help us to use in big and little ways our resources here to invest in kingdom purposes. Lord, give us a passion to do that here at FCC. And help us, Lord, as we sing the gospel now to build joy, to grow in grace, and to share this gospel to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.